11. The Colbert Built during the 1950s, the Colbert was an anti-aircraft ship that was converted into a missile cruiser in 1970. She was the sixth ship and the second cruiser of the French Navy to be named after Jean-Baptiste Colbert. He was a French statesman who served as first minister of state from 1661 until his death in 1683 under the rule of King Louis XIV. The previous ship was scuttled at Toulon in 1942. It served the French Navy until 1991. As a vessel that served mainly in the Cold War era, she only saw combat once at the very end of her career during the Gulf War. From 1993 until 2007, the Colbert operated as a museum and a national heritage site. Guided tours enabled members of the public to see parts of the ship that were normally off limits, including its cabins and engine room. But the museum struggled with a chronic lack of funding and couldn't keep up with the maintenance and security costs, and in 2006, it closed for good. In May 2007, the Colbert was towed to the abandoned ship fleet in Landevenek. She was stripped for parts, mostly from the boilers and turbines, to sustain the helicopter carrier Jean d'Arc. The ship became surplus when Jean d'Arc was decommissioned in September 2010. On June 15, 2016, the Colbert was towed to Bassin, River Gironde, to be used for scraps. 10. North Truro Air Force Station from 1951 to 1994, the U.S. Air Force operated a general surveillance radar station just outside North Truro, Massachusetts. During that time, it boasted a staff of over 500 military and civilian personnel who supported the base's mission to detect, identify, intercept, and destroy hostile aircraft. Operations began during an era of fear about the Soviet Union's development of the nuclear bomb. The base functioned as both an air defense station and a support base for radar towers 110 miles 877 kilometers off the Cape Cod coast. In 1994, the Air Force officially ceased operations at North Truro, leaving behind barracks and family housing, a bar, a library, a bowling alley, a chapel, and other buildings. Most of the property was handed over to the National Park Service, which renovated and repurposed some of the structures, demolished others, and allowed some to fall into disrepair. 9. The Diefen Bunker Built between 1959 and 1961 in Ottawa, Ontario, the Diefen Bunker is a four-story underground shelter that was meant to house top-ranking Canadian government and military officials in the event of nuclear war. It was commissioned by then-Prime Minister John Diefenbaker amid escalating Cold War tensions and was designed to sustain 535 inhabitants for 30 days while enabling them to continue running the country. The Diefen Bunker was built in secret on a former farm under the codename Project Emergency Army Signals Establishment Ease. It's located in a valley relatively close to downtown Ottawa and was ideal for the need to retreat to a safe place on short notice. Construction on the 100,000 square foot, 9,290 meter squared shelter took less than 18 months from start to finish. It was used from 1961 until 1994, during which time it functioned as a Canadian Forces station that operated 24 hours a day and had between 100 and 150 staff members. During the Cold War years, the Diefen Bunker facilitated some of Canada's most top secret communications. Today, visitors can see the massive facilities firsthand, including the war room, the prime minister's bedroom, other staff bedrooms, washrooms, offices, machine rooms, kitchen, cafeteria, exercise and activity areas, and more. 8. Arousk 7 The Aral Sea was once the world's fourth largest lake, but it began shrinking during the 1960s because of Soviet irrigation projects that diverted the rivers that fed into it. By 2010, the sea had all but disappeared. All that's left of it today are a few small lakes. The territory that once made up Vosros Denaya Island, a 77 square mile, 200 kilometer square island that sat in the Aral Sea before it dried up, is split today between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. It's the former site of a top-secret Soviet biological weapons testing site that was built in 1948 and expanded in 1954. Known as Arosk 7, the facility tested many dangerous bioweapons, including anthrax, smallpox, plague, brucellosis, and tularemia. The site was designed to test the effects of deadly diseases. Not surprisingly, Arrows 7 was a dangerous place, but you didn't need to go there to be exposed to its hazards. In 1971, an accidental release of weaponized smallpox infected 10 people, killing three of them. A mass vaccination ensued, and around 50,000 nearby residents were inoculated, but the incident was kept largely hidden from the general public until 2002. When the Soviet Union fell in 1991, Arosk 7 was closed and its 1,500 residents were evacuated in the following weeks. 
Today, the site is littered with the remains of the island's abandoned structures. Because many of the dangerous biological weapons that were created and tested there weren't stored or destroyed properly, several of the containers holding them have sprung leaks. This makes it extremely dangerous for anyone to go there. 10. Anthrax burial sites have been decontaminated so far, as part of an ongoing effort to clean up the area. 7. Draclo Tunnels Built beneath Kingston Country Park in Worcestershire, England during the early 1940s, an underground complex comprising 3.5 miles, 5.6 kilometers of tunnels, originally functioned as a shadow factory for the Rover Car Company, a place where aircraft engine parts were produced. Known as the Drake Low Tunnels, their manufacturing use continued throughout the 1950s, during which time the site became a production facility for tank engines as well. In 1961, half the tunnels were converted into a top-secret headquarters, where the UK government could continue to function during a nuclear war. It was one of 13 underground sites of its kind that were created around that time for the same purpose. The Drake Low Tunnels and Bunker were kept secret from the public until they were decommissioned in 1993. In the years since then, the Drake Low Tunnels Preservation Trust has been working to restore and preserve the site, hoping to reopen it as a Cold War museum. Some sections are open to visitors, but there are areas that would need extensive work and probably wouldn't be accessible to the public for some time. 6. Albanian Bunkers Cold War-era bunkers are a common sight in Albania. That's because thousands of them were built between 1968 and 1983 under the radical communist leader Enver Hoxar, who was convinced that an attack was imminent. Hoxar was extreme in his ways. To give you an idea, he believed that Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong were both too soft. Fearing an invasion from both the West and the Soviet Union, he adhered to an isolationist policy. The paranoid leader wanted a bunker built for every four of the country's residents. Although he never achieved this goal, over 173,000 concrete bunkers were built during his 20-year rule. The dome-shaped structures were manufactured at a factory and delivered by truck. Albania's resources were already scarce when Hoxar embarked on his so-called bunkerization project. The massive endeavor stretched the country's resources to their limit, and they were never even used for their intended purpose. Nobody had a reason to use them until the Kosovo War and the Albanian Civil War during the 1990s, and even then their use was limited. A few of the bunkers have been removed, but many still dot the landscape today. Some have been converted into hostels, homes, and museums, while the rest are simply rotting in place. What do you think the rest of the abandoned bunkers could be used for? Let me know in the comments, and be sure to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. 5. Thinker's Lodge Before he became a highly successful investor in the American Midwest, Cyrus Eaton lived in the tiny Canadian fishing village of Pugwash in Nova Scotia. Besides becoming a wealthy entrepreneur, he was known for being generous and philanthropic. In keeping with these values, in the 1950s, Eaton offered his old home in Pugwash as a meeting place for scientists and intellectuals who wanted to ease Cold War tensions and brainstorm ways to achieve nuclear disarmament. The first meeting included Eaton himself and representatives from many countries, including the United States, the Soviet Union, Japan, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Austria, China, France, and Poland. They founded an organization called the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. It won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1995 and influenced several Cold War-related agreements, including the Partial Test Ban Treaty in 1963, the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 1972, and the Biological Weapons Convention that same year. Eaton's house, also known as the Thinker's Lodge, remains in place today and is preserved as a museum dedicated to the minds who came together there during one of the most nerve-wracking periods in recent history. 4. Balaclava Submarine Base The USSR constructed a facility known as Object 825 on the Crimean Peninsula in the small oceanside town of Balaclava, which has functioned as a Russian military port for centuries. Built underground as a naval installation in 1957, the Cold War era base was invisible from the open sea, affording it ample protection from prying enemies. It took four years to complete the structure. Builders blasted away rock to create a 2,000-foot-long, 610-meter tunnel that connects different sections of the interior. Object 825 was designed to both withstand an American nuclear attack and to respond to it effectively. 
It also served as a repair center for the Soviet Black Sea Fleet of submarines. The site was stocked with enough food, water, and other provisions for its 1,500-person staff to survive for a month in the event of a nuclear strike. For maximum security, an enormous set of doors and a concrete reinforced gate blocked each section of the base. Object 825 closed down in 1993 after the Soviet Union fell. In 2000, it fell into the hands of the Ukrainian Navy. By then, the site had been significantly looted and damaged, with all its metal having been removed for scrap. It became a museum in 2003. Russia seized the Crimean Peninsula in 2014 and is reportedly considering the possibility of restoring the submarine base for military use. 3. Hat Green Secret Nuclear Bunker Even during the later stages of the Cold War, governments were building and operating new secret bunkers. Included among them was the Hat Green Secret Bunker in Cheshire, England, which went operational in 1984. Unlike many other bunkers, its use continued after the Cold War ended until 1998, when it was converted into a museum. The property's use began during World War II, when it functioned as a fake-out site that was meant to confuse the Luftwaffe into thinking it was a vital rail station. During the 1950s, a concrete bunker was built and used for controlling military airspace. It was eventually abandoned and sat unused for several years before it became a Cold War nuclear bunker. After re-entering use in 1984, it functioned as part of a system of 17 sites across the UK that would enable the government to continue operating during and after a nuclear attack. Today, it houses one of the world's largest collections of decommissioned nuclear weapons, along with an array of Cold War and military memorabilia. Visitors can see how the bunker operated back when it was in use, and can even experience what it would have been like during a nuclear attack using a simulator. 2. USS Albacore Back when it was built during the early 1950s, the USS Albacore was one of the world's fastest and most sophisticated submarines. The 200-foot, 61-meter sub functioned primarily as a research vessel during the two decades it operated during the Cold War. It pioneered the design for the American version of the teardrop hull, which was built with underwater speed and maneuverability in mind. The US Navy never revealed how fast the Albacore could go, but admitted that the submarine reached the same maximum speed as its predecessor while using half the horsepower. They kept the vast majority of its operations classified and revealed limited findings and details to the public. The Albacore was decommissioned in 1972 because of repeated diesel engine failures. She was returned to where she was built in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and remains there to this day. Today, the sub is a museum that sits on dry land. Visitors have full access to the interior and can learn about the parts of its history that the military is willing to disclose. 1. Buckner Building On the western edge of Prince William Sound in Whittier, Alaska, the Composite Bachelor Housing Service and Recreation Center, also known as the Buckner Building, was completed in 1953. It was used to accommodate the Cold War era housing and recreational needs of 1,000 American soldiers. Once nicknamed the City Under One Roof, the six-story, 275,000-square-foot, 25,548-square-meter structure measured roughly 500 feet, 852.4 meters long, by 50 to 150 feet, 15.24 to 45.72 meters wide, making it one of Alaska's tallest buildings for some time. Built by the United States Army Corps of Engineers, it contained a mess hall, sleeping quarters, movie theater, bowling alley, small jail, and tunnels collecting it to other parts of Whittier. The Buckner Building was strategically located near an all-weather railroad port and deep-water ocean terminal that stayed ice-free year-round, enabling the base to play a crucial role in supplying anchorage with military necessities. The site's near-constant cloud cover protected it from potential airstrikes. A destructive earthquake struck Whittier in 1964, inflicting some $5 million in damages to the town and killing 13 people. Because of the Buckner Building's helpful directional alignment, which runs at an angle to seismic motion, and because its foundation sits on bedrock, it suffered no structural damage. The military pulled out of Whittier two years later in 1966, and the building subsequently changed hands several times. At one point, there were plans to turn the site into a state prison, but this vision failed to pan out. The Buckner Building fell into disrepair under the ownership of the citizens of the new city of Whittier, and has since remained in a cycle of freezing and thawing with the missing and broken windows and doors welcoming the elements inside with open arms. It went into foreclosure in 2016, but the site's future remains undetermined as local and state authorities grapple over what to do with it. To preserve history, the city would like to see the Buckner building saved, 
but the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation has recommended the structure for demolition. Thanks for watching. Which of these places would you most like to visit? Share your thoughts in the comments, and if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.